Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's broadcast on utilizing a multiplexed MRM panel for in vitro and in vivo monitoring of lysosomal dysfunction in the CNS by Paul Auger, a senior scientist in the DMPK department at the Denali Therapeutics. And I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to engage with us. You can submit as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just simply type them in to the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. And if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on the support tab on the top right-hand corner or use that ask a question on the left side. Please join me now in welcoming our presenter, Paul Auger. You may now begin your presentation. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. My name is Paul Auger. I'm from Denali Therapeutics, and I'm talking to you about utilizing a multiplexed MRM panel for in vivo monitoring of lysosomal dysfunction. Um, so quick intro. Um, some of the topics I'm going to cover for today. I'm going to talk a little bit about lysosomal function neurodegeneration. Um, I'll talk about the use of mass spec in neurodegeneration, and then and, uh, I'll go into details about multiplex protein panels for biomarker uh, and pathway analysis. Uh, looking at um, the mass spec side in, as well as some of the, the ways that we do QC metrics. And um, we'll look at a little bit of data from some of the CSF and cellular models we've applied to this method, too. So, a brief overview of the way that Denali sort of uh, goes about looking at neurodegeneration. So Denali employs the pathway-focused approach drug development. So um, uh, we have the, the, the targets that we come up with are through human genetics and from what we call degenerative genes, so, so genes that relate to generation. Um, um, we've broken these degenerative genes a number of pathways around lysosomal function, gliobite and cellular homeostasis. And so today I'm going to lysosomal function. Um, the, the peer in terms of lysosomal function covers there's a number of targets that we have in, in some therapies we have in the clinic. But we'll be talking about that today in depth. So, so targeting lysosomal function for generation, uh, the way that we do this internally is, um, or the, the way we've thought about this is that uh, there are a number of things that that sort of regulate or lysosomal dysfunction. Um, there's cellular stress. You have genetic. You have environmental factors. Um, and, and so, in in sort of the lysosomal dysfunction state is a reduced protein degradation. Um, you can get protein aggregation in things like Lan or Lewy body and Lewy bodies, and then when you get those aggregations, you'll start to get neuronal generation, and, and um, from that you'll get the, the, the depth of the dopaminergic neurons. Um, so, so the general hypothesis uh, that that we we've kind of modeled our lysosomal dysfunction around is that it's a central pathology of Parkinson's, and it leads to a protein aggregation of, of alpha synuclein in the Lewy bodies also part of their inflammation and death of dopaminergic neuron. Um, it's also indicated in other neuro neurodegenerative diseases. So um, the focus today will really be around some of the ways that we're looking at Parkinson's, but we do use light function for other um, <clears throat> other other therapeutic areas and other um, targets. And um, and so what we're trying to do here with this with this multiplex panel actually to kind of tie it all together is that we're looking at in developing a way to develop and monitor dysregulation of the pathway to identify potential biomarkers um, it, as early as possible. Uh, and so the way that, that I've worked or the way that, that our proteomics has worked on, on developing proteomics at Denali is really looking at it in kind of buckets. And so, um, so what I what I have here is sort of the, the the chart that we use to think about how we're going to do our proteomics work, and so in the really early stages of hypothesis generation, we do a lot of unrated discovery. So we do a mix of DDA, DIA, and TMP. We do less L, um, label free quantitation or lack, but um, but we have implemented some of that as well. Um, from there, we use those targets to help build some of these 
multiplex panels that we use uh, in, a, in a more broad sense. And so we view this as really as targeted discovery. And um, so I'm focused on that today um, about target qualification um, and looking at really sort of these broad multiplex MRM assays that take data from the untargeted side and, and kind of put them together to create a more um, uh, quantitative panel that will allow us to track changes in specific proteins and protein pathways. And then further down the line in, in things that we do is that once we really have validated some of these targets in, in this targeted discovery assays, we move them to a, what you would call a clinical assay development. Um, these are more biomarker, clinical biomarker assays um, on the peptide side. Um, so everything I'm going to talk about today is around peptides, but we do also have a metabolomics, lipidomics uh, group that does a very similar workflow for, for, for the assays around metabolites and um, that, are, that are also biomarkers. And in the clinical assay, you know, we, we look at really very focused targeted quantitation, very low end. So just a few analytes that we, we do full quantitation with full standard curves and, and um, a lot more rigor than say you would do in this sort of more targeted discovery assay. So the panel that I'm talking about today is actually a published panel. I'm going to be presenting the published part of it. There, there are more pieces to this panel, but I'm not able to share those with you. So I'll just be sharing the published portion of the, the panel that we'll be talking about today. And um, this panel actually came from uh, someone from the Zetterberg Lab, who's someone that is on our scientific advisory board. Um, the paper that it came from was uh, uh, Shodan et al., and it was published in 2019. Um, and in that paper, they, they looked at 18 proteins. There were 52 triptych peptides that they're monitoring. And um, what? And so here you can see kind of a list of some of these lys lysosomal um, proteins that they were monitoring. And then we actually, I, I drew up a little uh, association map here so you can see sort of how some of these proteins are associated together and, and where they kind of link together in the network. And then um, from there, the, their lab actually generated the, these data sets. And so these data sets that we're looking at are, are around single time point analysis for large cohorts of studies. And so these are disease specific cohorts. And they actually took this lysosomal dysfunction panel and looked at a number of different uh, disease areas, including um, healthy normal controls, PD, um, so Parkinson's disease, and then also Alzheimer's disease. And, and um, What they found in looking at these really sort of large cohorts was uh, was a pretty good, significant uh, in 19 of the 52 peptides. And the data itself, because it's single time, point, and so I think you, know, you really need these very large cohorts to find the significance. I think um, one of the one of the things that we don't do is single time point analysis, and mainly it's because you do need such large numbers of samples, and so. Um, the, the difference, that's one of the key differences in the way that we look at this panel internally versus um, the published data is that we were actually focusing on doing change from baseline measures, which are a little bit easier to interpret and need a, a much lower end to find significance. Um, but, but here you can see that in, in their analysis, they found a number of peptides that, that were, that were um, significant and that some of them were very disease state specific. Um, one of the things that popped out here is this APOE. An APOE status shows a direct correlation with AD versus other diseases, which I think is already fairly well known. Um, so they were reiterating that that data. Um, and so how do we kind of adapt this method? Um, so we, we took this method. It was a very, um, it was a lot more academic method. Um, it was a really good method, but we, we kind of took it or I, I interpreted the way that it was being done from the lab and really attempted not only to add some of our own internal analytes to it, but then to um, automate it and make it as high throughput as possible so that we could process larger numbers of samples. And so to do this, um, I employed a number of, of steps in the automation process. So we have a uh, Bravo assay map in our lab. And so we, we utilize that to do all of our protein digestion as well as our standard um, addition, which we use this little Mantis robot for. And then post, post uh, digestion, we actually do our cleanup step on that assay map as well using the RPS column. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. Um, and then we, of course, dry the samples down. 
we had our, our final set of standards, um, which we use the IRT standards to help um, track mass spec performance in the, in the assay. And then we run them over our 6495C triple quad in, a, in high flow mode with an AGS, AJS source. Um, so we're using a 2.1 by um, 150 uh, length column. And then we do all our processing within Skyline. So all of our data looks similar to this. And, um, and we use all our data metrics exported from here and we give them to biometrics and they do the, the final analysis for the clinical samples. Um, for all of our in vitro work, that's all done uh, in another group, but it's the same output. So one of the things that we wanted to do after automating this was automating this assay was to establish some really good QC metrics. Um, I think it's one of the most critical parts for these complex proteomic panels is to have the ability to track and QC the data throughout the process. And so one of the first things that we did was we decided to add an internal digestion control, something that we spike in in the beginning um, once we have the CSF thawed or the, the samples thawed. We spike in this internal digestion control. It's a non-human synthetic protein. Um, and we monitored two triptych peptides from this assay. We've actually updated this a little bit, and we, we had these peptides uh, made in a stable isotopically labeled form so that we could actually look uh, a little bit more accurately at, the, at these peptides and, and track them um, uh, with, a, with a better ratio standard to understand what our, what our actual recovery is. And then, um, <clears throat> then on the top right, you can see uh, we, we run a plate QC. And so this plate QC is actually a, a set of pooled samples, um, whether it's a biomarker, CSF cohort, or some sort of cell, um, cell cellular like lysate experiment. We create a pool of those, and then we run those with all of the other samples so that we can see how it, it tracks over time to make sure that we're getting a, a efficient chromatography as well as efficient recovery of the, the analytes as a, um, over time so that the system's working correctly, but then also that the, the, the digest is also working correctly. And then in the bottom, you can see that we actually monitor these IRT synthetic peptides. And so these are peptides that we purchased from Biognosis. Um, there are other people that make them. Um, we spike these in right at the end, and they actually help us to monitor the system performance over time. And so you can see system drift with these. Um, and, and they give you really just a, a flat readout of what the, the LCMS system is doing. And so these are all really critical. And um, the way that we visualize these through Skyline is that we actually use uh, auto QC and we push these to our lab key server and look at them in panorama. And then you can get uh, a, an output over time. Um, so it's a, it's a QC metric that is, is really interface so that every Everybody can look at it. So we share this data throughout the labs so that anybody who's running an assay can look and see how the performance of their assay versus all other assays is. And then they can also download their own data if they want to process it themselves. And so after we did all this, we decided that we were going to then look at some qualification, like a little mini qualification, since this is not a fully um, validated assay. We're just doing some, some pretty basic methods of qualification. Um, and what we found was that the, the automation of this assay, as well as the, the QCs, allowed this to be a really highly reproducible um, assay that gives us confident ratiometric measurements of protein changes in samples. And so we actually qualified this assay, um, the biomarker version of this assay, which was in CSF at three different volumes, um, 25, 50, and 100 microliters of CSF. Um, and we looked at a number of different things uh, in terms of stability, including freeze-thaw cycles, auto sampler stability, room temperature stability. We looked at dilutional linearity, uh, hemolysis. Um, and so I've just provided, you know, on the right side, some output from the 25 microliter um, val uh, qualification that we did. And so you can see, like, one of the peptides that I pulled out, you can see the, the peak area ratio across 30 replicate injections. You can also see... The bottom, the retention times, and how really just very tight they are across all these injections. Um, and so I, I've also provided some QC values here at 25 microliters. Um, we, we had of the 81 analytes that were measured, 2,430 measures at 25% CV. Um, we had roughly 28.4% fail reproducibility at 25 microliters, which was about what we had expected because there are a certain number of analytes that at 25 microliters we cannot detect. Um, which was roughly 30% of them. 
Um, and so and so that gave us the detection statistics um, so that when we do this assay, we understand what analytes we can detect at each specific volume. So we know that at 25 microliters, we get roughly 75% of the peptides. Uh, at 50 microliters, we see roughly 85%. And then at 100 microliters, we see greater than 95% of the peptides at a uh, CV of less than 25%. There's still um, a few peptides associated with certain proteins that we do not have uh, high confidence at, even at 100 microliters. And, and um, those those peptides were removed so so that we don't have to, um, so that this number actually goes to 100%. So one of the things that, um, that was really, really critical for us when we were doing this, this qualification um, when we started the qualification at 25 microliters, we were doing a pretty fast gradient for this number of analytes at 30 minutes. Um, and we found that when we went to, uh, to the larger volumes of CSF, we were having a really hard time getting the same sensitivity. We were actually losing quite a bit of sensitivity. And um, so I started playing around with the gradient. I, I was hoping to keep it at, at a shorter time, but we ended up having to make it much longer. So we had to double the gradient time. But in doing so, that actually um, helped us quite a bit. It, it increased the protein. Um, the increased protein load really dictated that we needed it. But um, the higher volume actually increased the chances in the, um, of seeing the changes in more proteins because we were able to get up to that number of uh, 90, greater than 95% by extending the gradient. Um, prior to that, we weren't seeing anywhere near that number at 100 microliters just due to the fact that we couldn't separate everything and get away from the noise that was being generated by having so much background in such a compact um, uh, gradient. So, so this was incredibly important for us. Uh, it, it, it did lower our throughput overall, but I think the, the gain in terms of overall sensitivity is worth that, that loss in throughput. But it's something to keep in mind when you, when you are developing these types of assays is that they're not necessarily very fast because you have so many analytes. They, are, they do consume a lot of instrument time. Um, so, so that's that's one of the one of the biggest challenges for us in the lab is, um, you know, getting researchers to understand that when they submit samples, they're not going to have their answer in like say three days because we're running like a three minute gradient. But you know, it's going to take probably three days just to run all their samples. So, uh, <clears throat> and then from there, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ac the actual sample prep. And so, you know, we like I said previously, you know, we wanted to automate this and we wanted to use our assay map for this. Um, and so in doing this, this ramp up in the automation, one of the things that we found was that using the, the standard five microliter bed volume cartridge for the RPS um, cartridge that the assay map uses to do C18 SPE cleanup, um, we, were, we, were getting mute, like, we were getting basically um, reduced recovery at higher volumes of some peptides, which kind of makes sense because you, the as you increase the pro overall protein load, you're going to probably see a decrease in, in the capacity of the column to certain analytes. And so basically, that's what we were seeing. And so on the left-hand graph here, you can see that um, what you would think, what you might think you would see, especially in some of these peptides, um, say like the third one in or this like sixth one in, where, where you're not seeing any increase once you uh, of the, the peptide intensity as you add more volume, um, it, we, we were actually able to recover that by going to what are these sort of beta assay map columns. Um, I know that Agilent has released 25 microliter bed volume um, columns for protein A and I believe strep avendin, um, but they haven't released the RPS ones yet. Um, and, and so Steve Murphy was actually great. And, and we, I've been working with him for a long time and he really helped us with this. And he sent us some, some beta columns at the 25 microliter bed volume to test out and they made an enormous difference. And so you can see um, kind of as we overlay here, you can see that, you know, at 25 microliters of CSF and the five microliter versus the 50 and 100, you actually start to see this, this, this recovery, um, which is really what we, what we want to be seeing here. You know, you can see this, you know, like this third one, if you compare it with the previous graph, you're seeing a much larger amount of recovery that would be indicative of, of the increase in volume that you should be seeing. So we're not having a capacity issue anymore. And when you really sit down and look at it and you compare the recovery um, between, say, like the 50 at 5 microliter versus 100 at 5 microliter, you, you, once you start putting them on top of each other, you can see where um, the 25 microliter bed volume column really makes a huge difference because you do start to see um, it, it, it 
these these substantial gains in recovery that were all due to the column capacity. And so, you know, one of the main things that, that we, you know, we've always thought with the assay map was that the some of the five microliter columns were necessarily um, the right format for, for some of these analyses that had high protein content, especially for CSF, um, because in CSF analysis, you typically need much larger volumes than you need, say, in plasma or blood. And so this this actually going to these higher 25 microliter bed volumes really really helped us out a lot. It gave us um, the the dynamic range that we, we we needed without having to go offline to do um, offline SP, which I was really wanting to avoid because it it puts a, a really large burden on the people in the lab doing doing the sample preparation. So now let's look at some data. Um, so here I'm looking at just, uh, you know, really this is just four samples. <laughs> um, this is sort of what I was allowed to, to show, but, but what I did was I just took a set of, of samples, one healthy normal control and then three PD CSF samples. And we looked at a comparison and the differences of specific peptides from the multiplex panel. And again, these are just individual time points. So you can't glean too much information from them, but what you can tell is on the left-hand side, you have uh, a number of proteins that show some decreased uh, quant or you know decreased peak ratio, um, which could be indicative of of lower protein concentrations by um, by stratifying by disease, right? So the healthy normal control is this this big green marker on the left here, and then the next three are all the PD patients. And so, like for this ubiquitin peptide, you can see that the healthy normal control on the left is much higher than the other three. Um, the same thing for LAMP2, TPP1, FUCO, FUCO, and then APP. Um, um, this is one of the, I think, four APP peptides that we measure. And to the same accord, you can look on the right-hand side, and you can see where um, comparing the healthy normal control on the left to the PD patients on the right, that you can, in some of the patients, you can see an increase. And, and then in this one middle patient, you don't. So uh, there, there's actually a little bit of a patient variability here, too. Um, and some of these very interesting proteins like, um, you know, CO9, TCO2, and, and then uh, cathepsin D. So, so it was really very promising that we were able to, even in this just very small uh, subset of, of samples, see some, some differences in proteins that, of interest. Um, and in, in the expanded analysis, we definitely see a lot more of this. So, you know, this is really promising. I'm, I'm, I've been really happy with the performance of this so far and as a biomarker assay in human CSF. And, and we've implemented it in, in a number of studies so far, and that, that the data is still being analyzed internally. But um, I'm, I'm pretty confident in, in the quality of the data and, and hoping that it will really help us to start finding some, some good biomarkers uh, associated with these pathways for Parkinson's. Um, <clears throat> so the next thing I'm going to talk about is how we've started adapting this panel for, uh, for in vitro work as well. So um, on the discovery side of our organization, um, there's a lot of work that's done in cell models, um, and and so uh, we, you know we look for biomarkers as early as possible and trying to trying to interrogate these these pathways. We really want to see if we can um, implement this as early as possible to to see what kind of movement we're we're looking at in terms of proteins of interest. And so um, we we've started work in a number of cell lines, and so some of the data I'm going to show you is just from one of those. Um, and we're actually able to detect majority of the um, proteins um, in, in even just 25 microliters of lysate, uh, so roughly 30,000 cells. And um, I, we've actually been able to go down to about 1,000 cells and actually get really good data for this, pretty reproducible across uh, roughly um, 27 of the 33. And I think there are a few proteins in the, in the original biomarker panel that uh, are, are more blood-based, and so I'm not sure that we'll... It's, it, it's pretty clear that we're not going to see those in cell lysate, so I think this... This number is actually really 27 to 27 because I think there's a few of them that we just won't see in, in, the, in the cell lysates. We also try to look in media. That that's a lot bigger challenge just because of the number, because of the amount of background protein that's in there. And um, so in 25 microliters of media, we're really only able to see a handful of proteins. Um, some of it could be just because the proteins aren't actually expressed out of the cells. Um, but we're, we're, we're working on that. And, you know, there's, there's still some more work that we need to do to look at, say, maybe albumin depletion or if there's a way to do a dilution series or to remove the albumin to get at some of these analytes. But, you know, this is ongoing work. But it's very exciting that we're able to apply this, um, this panel also to 
to these more early um, the early projects because it allows us to get away from just doing a lot of hypothesis generation and actually answer some questions with with proteins that, that are of great interest to us pathways that we're trying to, to modulate. And so um, just looking a little bit further at the data that we've gotten from our in vitro models, um, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's actually a lot of excitement around this because we are able to see by looking at, say, certain, certain knockout states with certain treatments versus saline that you can see both, um, uh, you can see recovery upon treatment with, you know, in these different knockout states. And so it, it's really, this is great because it allows us to do these in a, in a higher throughput than, say, developing a number of single plex or even like low end multiplex immunoassays. Um, you know, developing a, a lot of immunoassays to screen for all the proteins that we have in these panels is incredibly expensive and very time consuming and often doesn't actually work, <laughs> um, which is not that surprising. Um, so having this is a really powerful tool because it allows us to to really validate some of these markers that we're interested in pretty quickly. Um, I know that a 60 minute runtime doesn't seem quick, but when you think about the amount of time that it took us to develop this versus say developing a, a, a you know 35 roughly immunoassays, this, this is a lot faster. So um, this is nice. It, it really um, helps us out a lot in, in terms of, of biomarker uh, biomarker analysis, early biomarker analysis, but then it also gives us um, some pathway specificity to in um, protein changes within the appropriate models. So we can see, you know, modulation of lysosomal proteins and knockout models um, towards, you know, wild tripe, you know, with treatment, but we can also see that some proteins don't show treatment effects, which is actually really important for us to know. Um, so, so this is, again, this is great. This is a fantastic application of this that that you know we're we're really happy about and took very minimal uh, changes to the actual method to get to this. So that was even that was even nicer. And so lastly, I'm going to wrap up here and um, kind of highlight uh, you know you know what we've sort of learned so far at Denali from building these these highly multiplexed assays and that they're incredibly useful tools for the interrogation of cellular and in vitro systems. Um, the data from our triple quad analysis shows ample sensitivity for analytes in our, and even in the sub nanogram per mil concentration range. Um, we're able to multiplex analysis um, for higher throughput versus single plex or low multiplex amino assays. Um, and then, it, it, you know, in, in the 18 proteins shown here, that that that's you know, we're able to do 18 proteins versus say three to six in, in an amino assay. And then. Um, our method development is, is a lot faster by LCMS versus you know, the amino assay with fewer reagents. We don't need antibodies. Um, and then proteins and peptides can actually be added or removed really easily. Um, we, can, we can subset these panels to, to fit the analysis that we need very easily once we've qualified the proteins or peptides. And so that actually also speeds up a lot of this and um, makes, makes for... Um, custom tailoring these these assays to, to individual um, projects a lot easier. Um, and then automation of the routine process decreases the variability and increases our throughput and it reduces the manual steps for the users. Um, and so it takes a lot of the processing out of the hands of the biologists, which is great because that actually really tightens up the, the, um, the data that we get at the back end. I think having more, having too many users putting samples into a process really um, hinders the usefulness of the process. So, so automation is really important for, for these types of things. And then um, lastly, these multiplex protein panels have a lot of utility in the biomarkers in biomarker selection, but also pathway modulation. And so with that, I would like to just acknowledge a number of people that have really helped me in the lab. Um, you know, Kirk is, is my supervisor, so he's been really supportive of this. Um, Catherine joined my group at the beginning of this year, and she's been instrumental in helping to get all the automation up and running. Um, and then Jung and his group on the metabolomic side, Jung has provided a lot of support on the, on the data analytics. And then um, the rest of these people are all people that have had contributions in some way, shape, form over the life of this project. And so with that, I would like to say thank you and uh, I'll take any questions. And thank you, Paul, for that informative presentation.
Now we will turn to our Q&A portion of the webinar. And I just want to remind our audience members to go ahead and submit some questions if you haven't already in that Q&A box to the left of your screen. So let's take a look. It looks like we already have a couple of questions coming in. Our first one, Paul, did you perform any untargeted discovery work prior to building this panel? Uh, hi, yeah. Um I just wanted to say too, thank you to Agilent for um, for giving me this opportunity to present uh, the data that I have. Um, but yes, yeah, so um, around that question, we did. Um, so so this is um, this panel is actually kind of a, a hodgepodge of things. You know, we used the data uh, or the you know the, the data from our external um, scientific advisory boards lab, but then we also used a lot of internal data to build the panel. Uh, it was uh, it came to us through a number of. Oh, Mainly through um, DIA analysis, uh, we, we did a number of um, untargeted discovery uh, analyses on, on different types of samples, and were um, and and so yes. Yeah, so long story short, yes, we did use a number of untargeted um, discovery uh, experiments to help build the the total panel that we are running internally. Thank you so much. And our next question, I see that you mentioned the panel you currently run is larger than what you have presented. What is the final size of the panel you currently run? Uh, um, so uh, the, we run, so the total number of peptide or protein analytes that we run um, is, is 33. There's, there, so there are 33 proteins of interest. We all have damnation um, proteins that we monitor. Um, mainly to see, uh, you know, if there's hemolysis in the samples, it, it helps us also to understand how that hemolysis might affect um, other analytes in the panel. And then we, you know, there's there are the control proteins and stuff. So in total, um, there's 38 proteins. We have 83 peptides. Um, there's 164 precursors, and then I believe there's like 500 and like 10 or 11 transitions. So it's a uh, it's a pretty beefy panel. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, we we had to utilize uh, scheduling, um, and and I think that that you know in one of the slides I showed um, how tight the chromatography was over a certain number of runs, and and, I, and that that's one of the really critical things with you know these types of assays because they're so large and there's so many transitions because you know typically with a peptide you're monitoring. You know, it, it, unlike a small molecule with a peptide, you know, you're monitoring multiple transitions per per precursor. Um, you really, you know, you need to have a very tight uh, scheduling window and good chromatography. So, so yeah, so um, there's a lot of analytes in this in this panel. Paul, thank you again for your presentation and for your time today. We really appreciate that and value it. I know you're at work today, working hard. Would you like to provide any last comments for our audience members before we go? No, I'm good, but um, thank you for having me um, and uh, everybody enjoy your day. And as a reminder to our audience, questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed via the email address you provided at the time of registration. Thanks again to Paul and to everyone who participated in this presentation. We hope that you will check out the Agilent exhibit hall and enjoy the rest of today's events. Take care, stay healthy, stay safe. Bye-bye, everyone.